Let's talk product strategy and product roadmaps. This can be one of the most confusing, challenging, and even ambiguous tasks for product managers to navigate. However, it's also one of the most important and influential things you do as a product manager. I've been there many times myself where I felt so stuck and confused putting together a roadmap. And there is a reason why that confusion exists, which we will talk about today. But every single time I go through a road mapping or strategic exercise, I learn something new. And what I really want to convey to you before we get into this presentation is that there is no right or wrong way to do product strategy and product road mapping. Every company, every person, and almost every year, you might do this differently and that is okay. And that is really testament to the fact that it is a little bit of an art over a science. And I'm probably gonna say that a few times in this video, but without further ado, let's get into it. And I have prepared this presentation based on my own product experience, but also from learnings, uh, frameworks and tools and really a mindset that I've picked up from so many other product leaders and thought leaders in the space. So keep that in mind. I will be referencing some of them and some of their work, and I will be linking some other videos or articles that I highly recommend you go away and watch that will really help you in, again, just really working on this mindset around product strategy and product roadmap. Here's what I'm going to cover in the rest of this presentation. You're going to get an understanding of what product prioritization is and how you can think about planning for your product, your product features, or your given product area. You're going to understand that there are so many different factors that feed into prioritization, and it is not just what is on your backlog or what your customers are telling you. Yes, those things are important, but there are other lenses that you really need to consider. Like what is strategy? What isn't strategy? How much do you in your given role, depending on where you're at in your product career, how much do you need to worry about the strategy? And then lastly, I'm going to get practical. I'm going to get tangible. And we're going to talk through how you actually put together a really succinct roadmap slide deck and we'll walk through that template. This video and presentation is going to be for you if you are new to being a product manager. So I'm talking about in the early stages of your product management career. So maybe you've never put a roadmap together or maybe you have done it once or twice. Maybe you've done it with the assistance of someone but you're fairly new to doing it. This video is for you if you are just really unsure where to even get started with a roadmap. You've tried it before, you've made it up, you've done it a few different ways. Doesn't matter where you are at in your career, if you have any confusion around how to create roadmaps, this video is for you. This video is also for you if you are well into your product career and you're starting to think more strategically. We can all own roadmaps for our features or even our specific products, but at some point you do need to start thinking more long-term and more strategically. And the earlier you can start putting yourself in that mindset, the better, especially if you want to progress into product leadership. But this video will be really, really relevant for you if you are already there. And then lastly, maybe you're not a product manager, but maybe you work with product managers or you are a product marketing manager. Maybe you're an engineer, maybe you work in sales, but in some other way you are interested in how product decisions are made, this might also be useful for you. And if you're thinking, hey, I'm not actually responsible for creating a product strategy, this video is still going to be for you because what it will allow you to do is to understand why product strategy is important to product roadmaps. And then at least you can go away and ask the relevant people the questions you need to about the strategy. And you can go away and look for that information that you don't currently have. So don't feel like you need to be the person who is crafting that strategy. You absolutely don't need to be because you should be sourcing that information from elsewhere if you don't already have it. Now, I have had a lot of inspiration for this video and I want to share some of it with you. So I have had inspiration from people asking me questions around how do I prioritize my backlog? How do I create a roadmap? So that could be in terms of how you actually make the prioritization decision or how you actually put it into a document. Like, what does that document look like? I've also been inspired to make this because I know from my own experience that making roadmaps is really hard, especially without understanding the bigger picture. And there are so many PMs I speak to who try to make roadmap and prioritization decisions, but they don't know the bigger picture. And they also don't know that they should go and ask for that bigger picture. I'm also inspired to make this video because 
we talk a lot about framework and frameworks and tools and systems are great by the way, but they are a very narrow way to think about prioritizing. And lastly, I mentioned this before, but there is this perception that you need to prioritize based on your backlog and your customer feedback. And yes, you do, but there are other lenses that are very, very important for you to take into account. And here are just some of the comments I have received from all of you on roadmap best practices. How do I prioritize features in the backlog and techniques to do that? Any tips for beginners? How do you share roadmaps with stakeholders? And really just bringing some discussion, some clarity, and maybe a bit of structure to road mapping. If any of the people who left these comments are watching, leave a comment down below on this video. Um, I hope this will be really helpful for you. Now, this is what we're working towards. If you're thinking about your plans for the next six to nine to 12 months, you wanna go from living on this cloud where you could do all of these various things. And the cloud, by the way, is also meant to represent quite a bit of lack of structure a lot of ideas that maybe don't relate to each other, potentially ideas that are incomplete, but basically a cloud of all the things you could do. And you wanna walk away with a much clearer plan, the plan could change, but a much clearer prioritized plan of initiatives that you wanna execute on. This is the goal. Now, if you're wondering how you define a product initiative, there's again, no really hard and fast rule. I would think about it as the effort you're putting into develop or enhance or improve something. And the initiative is so much more than just the product development work, by the way. It can include the discovery. It can include the research and the marketing you might do, even like the strategizing of how that initiative should be planned and come to life. Think about the initiative as the really top line thing. So to give you an example of uh, a couple of initiatives, if we take the YouTube example, YouTube could have an initiative around community building tools. So this could be broken down into tools for creators for creating content, tools for creators for collaborating with their subscribers. It could even have a monetization aspect to it whereby you have a gated community. So those are all specific product or feature ideas for how you bring the community building tools initiative to life. They could have another initiative, which is around personalization via AI. And again, you could achieve that in so many different ways. So there's no hard and fast rule about how granular your product initiative needs to be, but it can be rolled up into multiple features, multiple products, multiple activities across product and development and design and marketing. Or it could be something really specific where you want to build a specific feature and it is strategic enough of a feature whereby you want it as an initiative in itself. So think about the initiatives as really the thing that you want to achieve rather than the actual activity that will go into it. Now, if you're watching this video, I'm making some assumptions around how you might currently roadmap. This is based on the feedback I've had. This is based on the challenges I myself have experienced in the past and just a general understanding of how confusing roadmapping can be. So currently you might roadmap using a framework. Frameworks, like I said, are very useful. Now, currently you might be prioritizing using a framework. There are countless different frameworks to help you think about how to prioritize what you should do next. You might also be prioritizing because you have really noisy, really loud customers who are asking you to just get something done. Or you might be prioritizing the customers that have the oldest request, or you might be prioritizing some of the requests that are the biggest and the hairiest problems. But basically you're prioritizing things that are coming directly from customers and they're the ones telling you what you should do. You might also just be making it up and that's okay. Like we've all been there, I've been there. Uh, and if you're not making it up, maybe you're just leaning on someone else. Maybe if you're just starting out in your product career, you're not really making those decisions around prioritization. And that is okay. You might be leaning on your product lead to do that. So that is totally fine as well, but I think this is still very helpful for you to understand. And you might also be road mapping and prioritizing in some other artistic way, because I'm gonna say this over and over, it is a bit of an art over a science. And then there might be some of you who have this down pat and you might be prioritizing your roadmaps based on your company strategy and your product strategy. That means it's been well communicated and you understand what it is. Therefore, you know the work you should be doing to accelerate and support that strategy. But I have a feeling there's probably fewer of you that are in that basket. And even when you do have a clear strategy, it doesn't necessarily make things easy. 
you have another piece of the pie in terms of the information you need, but by no means does that mean it's now really easy and clear to make a decision. Like you still need to make tough decisions, say no and evaluate trade-offs. I've already jumped the gun on this, but I think for the second or third time, I'm gonna say, I think prioritizing and road mapping is a little bit of an art versus a science. We talk about data a lot when it comes to product management. And yes, you should collect metrics on your products. It's very important to understand how your products are being used. But is that data the biggest thing you should consider when you are thinking about what you do next? Not really, because there are so many other things that go into that mix, which we're going to talk about. Now I'm going to expand on why product prioritization frameworks are not always the best thing to consider when it comes to thinking about your longer term roadmaps. Now the RISE framework, by the way, stands for reach, impact, confidence, and effort. I'm sure you are familiar with this. If you're not, there are 10,001 uh, articles you could go and read about it. So I won't go into it now, but basically you plug in some numbers for each of those criteria and you come up with a score. And based on that score, you prioritize the thing you should be doing. Now, the reason that frameworks like this don't always work is because you are making a guess with your numbers, right? When you are putting down the effort for something, it is really a finger in the air estimate. When you are guessing the impact something might have, it's again, kind of a subjective guess. This framework doesn't take into account what your product strategy is. This framework does not take into account what your competitors are doing. This framework does not take into account what is happening in the industry. Rice often favors things that have a, a lower effort and a higher confidence. So you can see that even from this example, the first row has a 75% confidence and only a uh, two out of five effort. So if you're fairly confident that something is going to work and it's not going to be that much effort to get it out, of course, it's going to get a high score versus let's say something like number four versus something like number three. It has relatively higher effort and 50% in confidence. Now, what if number three was actually the thing that was going to help accelerate your strategy, but you only had three pieces of customer feedback for it. Does that mean it is less important than the thing that had 10 pieces of customer feedback like row two? Absolutely not. So really what I'm trying to convey here is that Rice only looks at things in a very particular way. And another example of a product prioritization framework is the Moscow. This is what you must have or your product feature or your product must have, what it should have, what it could have and what it won't have. And this one is really simple to explain why it's not fantastic is because this is subjective. Different people will probably come up with a different opinion. Ultimately, someone's going to be a decision maker, but there are just not enough important factors taken into this prioritization method that just makes it a very narrow view for when you are prioritizing strategically what you want to do in the next six to nine to 12 months. Basically, there is no formula that will perfectly prioritize what you should be doing. There is an aspect of experimenting and obviously with being lean and agile, it means you might make the wrong decision, but that's okay because as long as you've learned from it, you can change it. So no amount of research and discovery, prioritization frameworks or tooling is going to ever give you full confidence that you're making the right decision because there often isn't just a black and white right decision. There can be gray decisions. There can be decisions you make with prioritizing that could have gone really well should you have marketed something differently, right? It's not always about the product that you build. It's how you get it out to market. Now, this all comes back to why is prioritizing difficult? If you are really, really challenged with knowing what is the right thing to prioritize, you might want to ask yourself if you understand what your product strategy is. So if you cannot prioritize, you probably have a strategy problem. Full disclosure, I got this particular image from the link mentioned in the corner here from Ravi Mehta. He was a product leader at, I think, Tinder. He has a really good podcast with Lenny's podcast, and I highly recommend visiting this link I have, which is the product strategy stack. And there's a version of it that I'm actually going to go through now. So this is my own version of it. All too often we think about the product roadmap in isolation. We think that we need to create this roadmap and then someone's gonna go away and work on it and bring this thing to life. But really the product roadmap is almost the thing at the bottom of the stack, bottom of the cake in my version. You cannot really have a roadmap if you don't know where you're going. And to know where you're going, you need a product strategy. 
because the roadmap should enable that strategy and the product strategy should be informed by where the company wants to go and therefore the company strategy. And of course, we know the big lofty word vision, vision, mission, whatever you want to call it. That's like the big, hairy, audacious future that you are trying to create. I have seen some product leaders say that you should actually create your roadmap before you create your goals, hence why the arrow that I have just to indicate to you that there are differing views on whether your goals should determine your roadmap or your roadmap should determine your goals. Your product roadmap can never replace your product strategy. Your product strategy is not the roadmap. I think those two things maybe can get intertwined sometimes, but let's make that really clear. Your strategy is where you are headed and how you're gonna get there. But the roadmap is the actionable plan and the work you are going to do to get there. You can also think about this cake in terms of the different roles you might have in a company. So the vision is gonna be set by the executive team. It's gonna be set by the CEO and people at that level. Company strategy as well. Product strategy is likely to be set by the person heading up product. Typically that can be a VP of product, a head of product, chief product officer, you know, again, at that very high level, depending again on how big the company is and all of those things, that strategy should be filtered down so that different parts of the product organization can then come up with their own version of their strategy. Let me use the example of YouTube. Let's say YouTube has a product strategy for 2024. There are so many different parts of YouTube, right? There is the creator side of YouTube, the experience where I am uploading content. There is the viewer side of YouTube where you are watching videos. There is the YouTube app. There is the YouTube experience on browsers like so on and so forth. But each of those areas of YouTube and the product will have their own strategy and their own goals. And then each of those will have their own roadmap for how they are going to achieve those goals. So this is what the ideal flow looks like. When you really break down what we mean by strategy, it is what are we trying to achieve? Let's actually break down that strategy into a few metrics or KPIs, what are those numbers that we're really trying to influence and move? So when you're coming up with the cloud of all of the ideas and all of the things you could possibly do, you still need to think about those in the context of what you're trying to achieve. And what's really important is that there are some specific metrics that are set by, I don't know, whoever is owning the strategy or whoever is leading your product area. You need to have those metrics in place in order to make sure the ideas you're coming up with support that. So the big question being asked here is, what is the most important thing for us to improve this year? And when you think about metrics, they can be broken down into five different categories. Acquisition, so acquiring new customers or users, can be retention, making sure you keep a hold of the users and customers you already have. It's monetization, activation, and engagement. So I put some examples here in terms of YouTube and how you can think about what metrics you might want to improve. And by the way, when I say you, I mean whoever the right role is in your given working situation, whether you work in a big company, maybe you're in a startup, maybe you are the sole PM in a company, whoever that person is should be coming up with this. The person kind of leading the product. If you work in a big tech company, you might have someone that sets this big hairy metric to support the strategy, and then you will break that down into relevant metrics for your own particular area or your product lead might do that. It really just depends on the structure, but this is ultimately what you are looking for. So if you are not responsible for coming up with your, your metrics for what you wanna improve this year, at least you can go and figure out who is responsible and then ask them to do so. And when you have these metrics, it should make your prioritization process a little bit more focused because you know the things you're definitely not going to do that year because it's not going to move the needle on any of these metrics. You could also have one metric you want to improve this year or you could have three or four or five. Like it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong. Um, so, but I'm just giving you the five common categories of product metrics. So now that you understand what you are trying to improve, let's think about all of the different ways in which you can brainstorm ideas for improving that thing. I have taken inspiration from this, by the way, from a video I will leave down below by a product thought leader. I have put my own spin on it, but uh, a lot of the fundamentals behind this come from that product leader. So these are the four main 
areas you'll want to consider when it comes to brainstorming ideas for what you want to do with your products in the next six to nine to 12 months. One is a product strategy. Second is the customer feedback. Third is the company vision. And fourth is the business growth you are looking for. And I'm going to go through each of these now. Basically, the product strategy and the company vision are the big, exciting, greenfield, hairy, audacious ideas that will give you really meaningful impact versus incremental impact. So typically when you're taking feedback from customers, they'll want certain things improved. There'll be bugs. There'll be little gaps in the product. And those are great to address, but typically those aren't going to be things that help your product or your company make leaps and bounds. They're going to be incremental things you keep improving and you could keep doing that forever. There needs to be a balance between gradually and incrementally improving an existing product versus doing things that are bold to actually really help you move forward. Try new things, take leaps and bounds rather than just incremental steps. Now let's start with product strategy. So before we talk about what product strategy is, let's really be clear about what it is not, because I actually think this is the easiest way to understand it. So your product strategy is not your roadmap. It is not the plan for what you are delivering. And it is not your vision. It is not new product features and it's not metrics. I know I just read off the slide, but it's really as simple as that. Whenever you think about these five things, just know that that is not the strategy. All of these things either inform your strategy, like the vision, or they accelerate and support moving your strategy forward. So what is a strategy? Now, I have done a lot of research and reading on product strategy. And one thing is clear. There is no consensus about exactly how to explain it. Everyone has their own version of explaining what strategy is. And that's why I think if anything you take away is just remember what your strategy practically and tangibly is not. But in terms of what it is, I've tried to summarize it in the simplest way I can, which is it's a choice of steps that you're going to take and steps being like big steps you're going to take to ultimately achieve your vision. Your strategy is how your product will actually accelerate and support the company's strategy. And I really like the last two. Your strategy is what you're going to come back to when like shit hits the fan. When things don't go your way, maybe you try something and it doesn't work, you're going to go back to what your direction was. And that's going to help kind of anchor you. And then lastly, your strategy will help to rationalize and explain your roadmap. So this is a bonus in going through this whole exercise where you brainstorm ideas based on the metric that you're trying to grow is because your metric is based on your strategy, you should be easily able to rationalize and articulate the decisions for what you have prioritized in your roadmap. When you prioritize something just because your customers have asked for it, that is going to get so much pushback and so much debate, rightly so, because that is not a strong enough reason sometimes to do something. But when you are making a roadmap decision that is based on where the business wants to go, based on customer feedback, based on the strategy of the company and the product, like all of those factors combined make for a really solid argument as to why you should or should not do something. Here's an analogy you can draw from the sports world to strategy. But when an athlete goes into a match or a game, they have a strategy. They're going to try different tactics and those tactics might be the equivalent of like your roadmap, but they might have to change those tactics. They might have lots of different tactics they're going to try, but it's the strategy that is the most important. So maybe they're trying a particular tactic and they keep getting punched in the mouth. They're going to have to fall back to what that ultimate plan, that ultimate strategy was. I don't know if that's helpful, but I kind of liked it. So I thought I would just put it in there to make this a little bit more lighthearted. Now, how do you create a product strategy? So this presentation, this video is, is not that because how to create a product strategy could be a whole video or two of its own. But what I wanted to, to give you was at least some resources um, that you can go away and look at in terms of how to create a product strategy. But the overarching theme you should see here is that there are so many different ways to create a product strategy. Uh, and I will leave some links below, but, but these are some of the resources and tools that I particularly like. I highly recommend checking out Gibson Biddle. He came up with the strategy for Netflix and one of his very popular frameworks for coming up with the strategy is 
the DHM model. This is how you delight customers in a way that's really hard to copy. So that's like your unique value prop and in a way that increases your margins. So he has a bit of a framework for how you can think about that when it comes to product strategy. And he has some really, really great videos on this as well. There is the example of Amazon and there are six pages. So the way Amazon do anything in product is by starting with the end in mind. They will typically put together uh, a press release. You may have heard of the Amazon press release process. They'll start with like what the end press release for a product looks like. Typically that's what you do last. But in Amazon's case, they will write that first because it gives them the vision for what they want to work towards. And I think the anatomy of an Amazon six pager is kind of similar, but it's focused on strategy. This one here I really like because it gives you a really great layout on a single page for thinking about everything you need to consider when it comes to a strategy. So you need to think about the problem you're solving, your solution. What is your USP or your unique value prop? Who are you doing this for? How are you going to make money? Um, you know, so on and so forth. So highly recommend this. These are all clickable links, by the way. So when you are going through this slide deck, you will be able to click on each image and that'll take you to the source where you can actually download these things. And the last two are a strategy one pager, kind of similar to the canvas, but just a different version of it. And then this book is quite popular. Roger Martin has his own framework for how to put together a strategy. And this is where I'm gonna leave how you create a product strategy. But if you have any questions about this, or if you do want me to make another video uh, related to creating product strategy, then definitely let me know in the comments below. But as it relates to your roadmaps, you need to have this to start with. When you have the strategy, as I've already explained, that is how it's going to be clearer to make decisions on what should be prioritized. So the takeaway here is if you are not responsible for creating your product strategy in your given working situation, that is fine. But at least you can go and ask for the strategy by whoever is responsible for it. And if there isn't one, making your roadmap prioritization decisions shouldn't be easy. All right, next let's touch on vision. I'm also going to go through this one pretty quickly because you can Google what company vision means. I haven't ever really created the vision for a company before, so I don't have experience personally on this, but we all know that a vision is what everything really starts with, right? Every company has a vision or a mission, and this is really your aspiration. And it is what the world looks like when you've achieved your purpose. I really like that explanation of it. Your strategy, as you saw in the cake earlier, can't exist if you don't know what the vision is. In terms of roadmaps and product plans, you might come up with new product ideas, new features, or even non-product specific changes that help to accelerate your vision. And that's why this is important. At some point, a company needs to make a bold move. Maybe it is to work on a brand new product. Maybe it's to go into a different vertical. Maybe it's to try and target a different customer segment. Like whatever it is, the vision can give you a pool of new ideas that can help to, to support that. And again, that can be one area of ideas that you can feed into your roadmap. Next is customer feedback. This is probably the easiest, so I'll go through this really quickly. You should be familiar with this. Your roadmap will be very influenced by what your customers want. But keep in mind as we're going through this presentation that that is not always the biggest thing for you to focus on. There may be periods of time, by the way, where you decide to only invest in addressing customer feedback, and that is totally fine. I've had experiences in the past where we've put aside an entire six months just to address really long standing features or, or requests that customers have, because sometimes there is only so long that you can say no and things really start to pile up. And we also decided that we'd rather just do it in one go rather than trying to manage customer feedback coming in for an existing product and trying to build something new and strategic at the same time. So it also really depends on how you set up your teams. Have a system by which you are able to receive customer feedback, um, uh, categorize it. Product board is really great. I've used it in the past. And be really mindful that your noisiest customers are not always the ones you should listen to. Sometimes you have to. I've had a lot of experiences in my product career where a very noisy customer that pays a lot of money often wins and we just have to end up building the thing for them. You make that 
business decision at the time. So yeah, I love this meme because I think it really showcases the dilemma that product managers get put in. And this meme should also show you that there is no right or wrong. If everyone wants something different, then how could you ever be completely right or completely wrong? You're always going to be satisfying someone. And it's the same thing with whether you're prioritizing customer feedback for your roadmap or something for your product strategy. Maybe you need to invest in something that's going to help you move towards your product strategy, but it, it doesn't give customers what they want right now. That's okay sometimes because you're still doing it for a very rational and logical reason. And it's just about managing customers. So really important factor to consider. I threw this in just to remind you that you can have a million and one different requests from customers, but you need to make sure that you put those ideas and requests into problems. At the end of the day, product building is all about problems. And if you are struggling to prioritize requests, maybe you can prioritize problems because Sometimes it's a lot easier to think about something when you know what it's going to solve rather than just a shiny new idea because it's, uh, yeah, it's like a feature request. Why is that feature request a thing? Is it going to help us solve the biggest, most impactful problem? So another model to kind of think about it, because if you are using a tool for managing your customer requests and you're just, you're probably hammered with requests, you, you still need some kind of model to work through how you prioritize those requests. So there's prioritizing for your roadmap, but there's also another level of prioritizing within your actual customer feedback system too. And last but not least is business growth. So this is really any other metric or objective that your business has. What is it that the business wants to achieve? It could again be related to those five categories I mentioned earlier, acquisition, retention, monetization, but it could also be things like conversion. It could be engagement, anything else that the business is trying to achieve. So as an example, it could be processes that you want to improve. These could be internal processes, but they could have an impact on the customer as well. It could be pricing changes. So you're not actually making a change to the product, but you're making a change to the price. And maybe it changes the number of customers that might be interested in trying your product because maybe you implemented a free trial. Maybe you implemented more granular plans. So maybe you simplified your plan so it's easier for people to understand. This could go on for days, but some kind of pricing change. It could also be finding new ways to get leads. Maybe you do that through your website and you change the way you receive leads through your website. It could be improving your customer support. Maybe there aren't specific changes you want to make with your product, but there are ways in which you can change how you support customers who are using it. Hope this gives you a bit of an idea around things that are not related to your strategy or your vision or specific customer feedback, but they're also important for the business. Another example for business growth, by the way, could be that you want to expand into a new country. So now we have all the ideas, right? We've gone through those four different areas and we have brainstormed ideas that come from our product strategy, how company vision, customer feedback, as well as other things that the business wants to improve. So now you have ideas that go much beyond just what customers are requesting and what is on your existing backlog. I guess what I should have said at the start is this is about really thinking expansively about your backlog, right? Your backlog is is restricted. Like your backlog information is coming from customers. It's probably coming from you. It's coming from other internal teams and it's probably coming from your engineering team, but it's usually lacking a view from all of these other strategic areas like vision and strategy and the business lens. Now you need to put those ideas into a list. And you might be thinking, okay, well, are you actually going to tell me how to do that? And the, the truth is, no, I'm not. Because even though you have now come up with this amazing list of things you could do, there is still a bit of an art to how you prioritize that. And it really comes back to that metric. When you have all of these ideas that you could execute on and they are linked to that metric, now you need to think about what is really, really most important. And one thing you can do is maybe think about balancing what small changes you can make versus what really big leaps and bounds you could make. Like I said in the past, I've spent 
an entire six months with my team, improving things very incrementally and addressing a lot of customer feedback. But that didn't really move us as a, as a product area forward a lot. It didn't help us strategically get anywhere. And it certainly didn't, let's say, make the business any money. So it's important to think about prioritizing things that are going to help grow the business. So it is important to think about prioritizing things that are going. So one way you can think about how you take all of those ideas and prioritize them is try to balance incremental and gradual changes and enhancements to your products with big leaps and bounds. In an ideal world, we would be doing product work that helped us take big leaps and bounds. So that is one way in which you can think about it. Try and prioritize the things that are going to help you, one, achieve those metrics that were identified at the start, because that is the most important thing. That is what you're trying to improve this year. And then think about the initiatives from your idea cloud that are going to help you do that in the the most meaningful way. So rather than making lots of incremental and little changes, you could think about prioritizing some initiatives that really help you make big leaps and bounds. Another way you can think about it is what is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck? Sometimes it does come down to prioritizing things that you can do with the least amount of effort, but they're going to give you the biggest impact or the most reach, right? Kind of like rice. But now you are using rice to prioritize this expansive list of ideas that you have and not just like a feature list. So sometimes you do have to work on the things that are going to be the most impactful for the amount of effort and money and resources you're going to put into it. But overall, it's good to try and balance incremental improvements with big strides that you can make that will help you move forward strategically. And when you think about this over the span of a roadmap, so that might be six to nine to 12 months, you don't have to do those things at once. It is really hard sometimes to do things in parallel. You could spend the first six months of your year, like I have done previously, just banging out customer feedback uh, requests or improvements. You could spend the latter six months working on strategic initiatives that are really going to help you get closer to product strategy. It really depends on how your teams are set up, how much resource you have, um, what your appetite is for doing things in parallel, etc. So now that we've understood all of the inputs that go into a product roadmap, let's talk about the product roadmap itself. So this could not exist without all of that prior thinking. Your roadmap is how you're going to achieve that strategy that we talked about. The roadmap is really the plan, right? That's why you often see roadmaps on a timeline. They don't have to be on a timeline. I'm going to share some examples soon, but they often are on a high level timeline that can be typically based in quarters or even in half year increments and sometimes even in months if you are a smaller company. While you might have a roadmap that spans multiple quarters or multiple months, it is very common for that roadmap to become less certain as it gets further out. Because in reality, you're making a lot of educated guesses. You're making a lot of assumptions about how things are going to go. Think of this example that we're kind of seeing in the world at the moment, which is a lot of companies pivoting their product strategy as well as their product roadmaps to accommodate for the fast moving um, AI trend that we're seeing. If nine months from now, there was some other new technology that I didn't know about, I can't plan for that in my roadmap. And that is totally fine. I'm going to make assumptions about what I think I should be doing in maybe six to nine months, but chances are it is most likely going to change. And I don't think I have ever worked on a product where the roadmap didn't change in six months or nine months, but it's still good to have it there as, as you need that anchor for like where you are headed. And the product roadmap is not focused on delivery. It is about what you will deliver, but it's not the actual delivery plan. Your engineering team will come up with that where they break that roadmap down into the next level. And to my earlier point, your roadmap can absolutely change. Anytime you share a roadmap with customers, it should have big disclaimers on it. I think it's called safe harbor, which is basically saying we can change this at any time. So definitely don't think of your roadmap as a commitment to your customers, but also to other stakeholders and 
cross-functional teams that you share it with because your roadmap should absolutely be a tool that you use to communicate what you are doing with your product, both internally and externally. Now I'm gonna jump into the template. As a reminder, I will have a link to the template in the description. Please be sure to make a copy of this before you edit it. You will have to go to file, copy, and then copy entire presentation, and that will be added to your Google Drive. Starting strong with the title slide, feel free to adjust this however you like. Ideally, the entire template should be adjusted to the design and color scheme and theme of your company. So be sure to do that. I've just used some random generic colors. Now you'll find that this template kind of mimics that cake structure. We're not just going to jump into the work we are, we're not just going to jump into the roadmap because we kind of need to paint a picture of what we're trying to achieve and why, and then we can show the work that we're doing. So by having some of these slides that I'm going to go through at the start of the template, you're actually going to make your life a lot easier for when you get to explaining what your roadmap actually is. So start with the vision. Hopefully this already exists for you. If you're in a larger company, it absolutely should. If you're in a smaller company or a startup, you might need to come up with this yourself, but the vision should be something that stays fairly consistent across all aspects of the company or the startup. So hopefully this is something that you can just quite easily reference from somewhere else. Next, we wanna talk about who our product is for. Right? It's always really good to set that as a reminder because you're going to have different segments of customers. You're likely to have different personas. Maybe your market has changed at some point. So let's be specific about who we are building for and solving for and why. So it's really important to go into the needs of each of your customer segments. You could also swap this out for user personas. I've just gone with segments, but the most important thing is that you actually talk about the needs of each segment or persona. And this is again going to be really helpful when you talk about your roadmap because your roadmap should be linkable back to the needs and the problems being solved for each of your different types of customers. Okay, next is objectives. This is really those metrics that I talked about. The two, three, four, however many metrics you have tweak this. Hopefully again, if you work in a larger company or you're working with someone who else who is creating and setting these goals, you can reference this from somewhere else. But we wanna make sure we come in really strong with the things we are improving this year. If they're quantitative, that is really helpful because then there's really no vagueness to it. So whether it's acquisition, retention, engagement, whatever your metrics are, put them in here because everything is going to anchor back to this. Everything in the roadmap is really relating back to every one of these slides, by the way, I hope you see that. But in particular, the metrics, everything you prioritize should help in some way to move the needle on these metrics. Next, we want to show what the market looks like. It's always really helpful at different points in time to remind people who you are up against, what is the current state of the market, whether that's direct or indirect competitors, because your customers are going to be choosing between you. The most important thing when talking about competition is not talking about everything that they are doing, but it's where you sit in position to them. This is one of the biggest things I see done incorrectly on all sorts of roadmaps, including startup pitches, which is you kind of just list who your competitors are and what they do. That doesn't tell me anything. What tells me something is what you are doing that is different to them, what you are doing that overlaps with them, and really how you are being positioned from your perspective or from your customer's perspective in relation to your comp competition. This is just another example of how you might lay out your competition slide, but again, make sure you include some commentary about how you, right? This is your business up here, how you are positioned against them. Don't just trust this table to make that clear. You can either add a bit of a paragraph, maybe another slide summarizing it, or maybe even talking points. Yeah, just another version of how you can lay out competition. Right, next we wanna talk about your unfair advantage, or you could also think about this as your unique value prop. This is again, something that is really important to convey over and over again. You need to be sure, you need to make sure you have the thing that differentiates you. And this is the thing that you often sell to your customers. If they're choosing between two companies, two products, 
there's got to be that thing that sets you apart. It doesn't have to be the product. Sometimes it can be the brand. Sometimes it can be the pricing. There are lots of different things that can affect this, but you want to make sure you're being really clear about what it is that makes you different. And then we get into the initiatives. So by the time you get to this point, you have articulated your big, bold aspirations as a company. You've articulated who you are targeting, which is not just important for the product you're building, but also for how you are marketing to them and how you are pricing to them. You've talked about the big metrics and goals you've set for yourself this year, and you've set some context in terms of the market and the industry and kind of what's going on outside of the immediate bounds of your product and your company, which is really important to do because that is a critical lens and piece of information to have as a PM. You can't just make prioritization decisions based on what's going in inside your bubble. You need to look outside your bubble because that's where a lot of threats lie. So now you can actually just list out what your product initiatives are. And this is that list of things that you've taken from that cloud uh, and you've put into the prioritize list, you are now going to share those. You could have three, you could have four. I've just randomly put three up here, but speak to what your main initiatives are and make sure you are clear about how they're going to move the needle on those metrics. I'm a big fan of visuals and mock-ups, even if it's something really conceptual. So feel free to replace this uh, random a YouTube mock-up that I have, um, but try to include something visual where you can. I think it really helps to communicate ideas, mm. especially ideas that are new or haven't really been shared before. And you're hoping for a, a strong reception of those ideas. This is just another format in which you could show your initiatives. So this one's a little bit more visual. This one's a little bit more structured, just an optional slide I added, but completely up to you how you yeah, showcase these. This is optional as well. If you have done some more longer term thinking, but you can put those initiatives for the next six to nine to 12 months on this. And then maybe some really high level ideas about some other future things you might be doing. This is optional and only relevant if you know what that is. But oftentimes when you're working on something that is moving you towards a longer term vision, it can be helpful to plot where future product work uh, related to that uh, will fall. So take this as you will and only use it if it's relevant for you. Now, by this point in the template, you have painted just the big picture, the vision, the metrics, the market landscape, and now the initiatives. So how will you actually achieve those initiatives? Only now do we get to the roadmap. This is a point I really want to emphasize that presenting your roadmap is so much more than just presenting your roadmap. You need to make sure you are taking people along on a journey whereby they understand not only what you're trying to achieve, but why you're trying to achieve it and why it is important and what else is going on outside of your bubble. So that by the time you get to actually telling them what it is that you want to do, they understand and hopefully they have far fewer questions. Although questions are still really good and you should be getting questions, but hopefully it makes it a lot easier for people to understand. Now, I always like to recap what you've done in the last year or in the last quarter or whatever time frame you like. I think it's really important to celebrate wins, highlight accomplishments, highlight, you know, really positive customer feedback or however you want to spin this. Rather than just talking about all the things we want to do, let's make sure we set aside some time to talk about the things we did actually do and possibly even insights that you had from those things. So if there are key metrics you can share, customer quotes, any kind of feedback that you've received on the stuff you've already done, that is really helpful. And here is a view of what your roadmap could look like. By the way, I know this is a slide deck. You can totally put your roadmap in a different tool. There are so many different tools you could use. You could use Notion, Trello, Jira, Product Board, Asana, Monday.com. So it doesn't really matter what tool you use. I'm just using a slide deck because it's easy and I think it's just simple rather than adopting a new tool. You can easily share it. People can comment on it. It's really easy to collaborate. So that's why I like Google Slides. What I want to convey here is that there are a few different ways in which you can present your roadmap. I'm not always a fan of putting specific dates down because it is a roadmap. It is on a delivery plan. So one way of doing this is using now, next and future. I think you should tweak this depending on the audience to who you are presenting. 
because if it's a, a, a broad cross-functional group, then they probably don't need to know really specific timeframes and they just want a general idea of what you're doing. And if you're presenting to your more immediate product group or of course your engineering team, then you might want to put down more specific timeframes. In your roadmap, I would recommend you include your initiatives and a breakdown of how they will be achieved. So going back to the earlier example of the YouTube initiative of let's say community building tools. You don't wanna just put the high level initiative on here, but you should have done the work to break down what that will entail. So if your community building tools includes new ways for creators to create content or more collaboration tools or a paid community, then those are the items you want to put on your roadmap because that's the thing you're actually going to work on. And there will be other activities you do as part of that initiative because there'll be research and marketing. You don't have to put that on the roadmap. It's really about the value you're going to ship. So just remember that because you've already shared the initiatives up here, you want to make sure the roadmap is the next breakdown of that. You don't want to just repeat the initiatives on the roadmap slide. The remaining slides in the appendix are optional and they really just show you some different visual ways in which you could talk to each of your initiatives or your roadmap items in a little bit more detail. You might want to break down the features of a, a given initiative. You might want to break down into some insights that you have from customers or even how you might break down a given initiative into very specific deliverables. Like it's really up to you, but this is an example. And then I actually referenced an example from Resort Pass, which I got from uh, Reforge. And this is a slide they had on their product strategy and roadmap deck, which kind of gave you a high level view as to what their goal is, some metrics and the things that they want to deliver. I think this is really nicely put together because it's visual, but it's got some data and it's got the things that you're actually trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve it with with the specific uh, features. And this is another example that they had as well, less visual, but it still conveys the work that you want to do and, and when you want to do it. And that is it for this product strategy and product roadmap video and template walkthrough. I really do hope you found this useful. Uh, if you have any questions, then please leave them below and I will be sure to get back to each and every one of you. And I guess I just want to end off by saying that remember that there is no right or wrong black and white way to do road mapping or to do strategizing. There is also no absolute black and white, right or wrong product prioritization decision that you can make. Everything you do is ultimately based on assumptions. As long as you can validate those assumptions to some extent and have a really sound rationale for why you are making a particular prioritization decision, that is the most important thing because ultimately the market and your customers and your users will tell how things actually go. You can only do so much prep work. So use everything I've explained, especially all of the different areas that input to the ideas for your roadmap as a way to rationalize why you are putting something on the roadmap. So as long as you are tying back every single idea to the goal and the metric that you have. So make sure you get that because if you don't have that, then you don't really know where you're aiming. As long as you can do that, then you should be able to rationalize why you should prioritize something, prioritize it, build it, ship it, get the feedback and learn. So yeah, with that, I'll leave you here. Thank you so much for watching again if you got this far and I will see you in my next video.